Good morning, everyone. Nice to see you all. Um, I'm eagerly anticipating 2018. I don't know what the Lord has in store for us, but I feel he has some wonderful things planned. And as I was praying, I feel the Lord was, had led me to the book of Acts just to look and see how he worked um, in the days after the Lord returned to heaven. And one of the things that the Lord used to really speak to my heart, um, in Acts 13, we see one of the great, kind of one of the beginnings of a great um, work of God in sending uh, Paul, the Apostle Paul, out with his brother Barnabas. Um, the Lord reminded me of the wonderful work that was begun when the Apostle Paul, uh, the Apostle Paul began his journeys. And I have that sense of anticipation with 2018. I don't know why. I feel the Lord's going to do something. Maybe it's because... We're, we're about to, the, the pillar of cloud is about to move and we have to move this building or I don't know exactly why that is, but I feel the sense of anticipation. And I was reminded of in Acts 13 that this, uh, a new era, so to speak, began for the church as the apostle Paul went out to preach to the Gentiles and reach many people with the love of God. And uh, one thing that encouraged me <clears throat> was in Acts 13, and uh, I, I was wondering, how did it begin? How did this new uh, season begin? And I was touched to see, if you look at Acts 13, verse 2, or if you look at verse 1, it says, Now there were at Antioch in the church that was there, so speaking of a specific church, there were prophets and teachers there, Barnabas and Simeon, who was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manian, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. So the Lord's gathered all these people together, and then in verse 2, it says, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And I was really blessed to see that phrase. Um, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting. And it spoke to me because I feel the Lord is preparing us similarly for some um, something great, some great move of his. And there can be a temptation to think, okay, well, let's just enter into monk mode and wait and just see, you know, nothing really we can do until the Lord kind of makes his will known and then we can take action. But I appreciated the picture of how the work of the Lord progressed here in Antioch. It says, while they continued in obedience. That's what I see, that God led them further. While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Lord then led them further. And I was thinking we can all have a great sense of hope and expectation that the Holy Spirit is going to speak to us and he's going to lead us in 2018. But how do we walk into that guidance while ministering to the Lord and fasting? I see it as an indication that we ought to take pains to attend to the Lord, to seek his will, and to be preparing our hearts for further instruction, so to speak. It reminded me of Abraham's servant. Do you remember in Genesis chapter 24? In, verse, uh, in the King James Version, it says something beautiful. Abraham's asking his servant, how did you find Rebekah? And, and he says this phrase, it's in the King James, he says in verse 27, I being in the way, the Lord led me. And I've always loved that phrase, I being in the way, the Lord led me. And if we expect in 2018 for the Lord to lead us in some wonderful way forward, how do we make sure we don't miss it? We have to be able to say like the servant, I being in the way, the Lord led us further. And so to me, what does it mean to be in the way, so to speak? I see that here in Acts 13 and verse 2. To be in the way means to be, first, ministering to the Lord, obeying all that he's given us. He's entrusted some precious instruction to us in the last few years. We have to be diligent to obey all that we've received. And then second, it says, and fasting. Despite, that he, despite the fact that he's given us so much, we have to be con conducting ourselves with a sense of holy expectation that we're longing for more. Not complacent, but eager. And I thought of these two phrases, ministering to the Lord and fasting, as completely obedient and yet completely unsatisfied. And that to me is really the burden that the Lord has given me for 2018. I being in the way, completely obedient and completely unsatisfied, the Lord led me further. And I believe that's how the Lord wants to lead our church too. Completely obedient to what we've received and completely unsatisfied. I think it will look different for each one of us as we think about, I think these two words are really important, ministering to the Lord and fasting. 
and may look different to each of us individually. But I wanted to share for me, what do these two things look like to me in my life and how I've been in the way, how the Lord's leading me in the hope that it might be encouraging to others. As it pertains, ministering to the Lord, what does it mean? It says, while they were ministering to the Lord, what does that mean? We've learned a lot about taking up our cross daily, following Jesus every single day. We've learned a lot about rejoicing in difficulties and offering up a sacrifice of thanksgiving. We've learned a lot about the importance of desire, eagerly desiring to prophesy and encouraging one another daily. But the specific burden that's been on my heart, all of those things are important. The specific burden that's been on my heart in ministering to the Lord is in the private ministry of bearing my brothers and sisters in my heart before the Lord, bearing one another's burdens in secret. And um, I was thinking of Zechariah. We spoke about this a couple weeks ago at the Men's Fellowship where we sang some songs and prayed together. But the ministry of Zechariah, we see that he was before the Lord and, and Joshua the high priest was brought before the Lord and Satan was accusing him. And Zechariah, when the Lord said, Rebu the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Zechariah couldn't stand back, even though it's a vision, even though he has every reason to stand back, yet he couldn't stand back. He had to say, put a clean turban on his head. He started interceding for his brother. And that's in secret, in his heart, that, that ministry, the ministry of Jeremiah that we learned about in the Through the Bible study, where of his secret weeping and secret mourning over sin in private. I wanted to share a verse from 2 Corinthians in chapter 11. I feel the Apostle Paul really in, exemplifies this Zechariah ministry of intercession, the ministry of Jesus that says he ever lives to make intercession for us. The example of Jeremiah and praying and weeping and mourning in secret. I feel I saw a picture from 2 Corinthians chapter 11. The Apostle Paul kind of lays out his resume. This is just to, just to make sure I'm clear. This is my definition for me of what does it mean to minister to the Lord, as we saw in Acts 13, verse 2. Ministering to the Lord. And one thing that really touched me, Paul is talking about, if you look at 2 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23, he says, you want to talk about being a servant of Christ? I'm going to speak like I'm crazy for a minute. I had far more labor, far more imprisonment, beaten times of that number. He goes on and he gives kind of his amazing resume of his labor on behalf of the church. And what really spoke to my heart is, if you look, you, there's a lot of really wonderful things we see externally. Um, but then in verse 28, he says, apart from such external things, you guys probably knew that all this was on my resume already, he says. But apart from such external things, there's a daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches. Who's weak without my being weak? And then this really spoke to me. Who's led into sin without my intense concern? 2 Corinthians 11. Verse 29, who's weak without my being weak? Who's led into sin without my intense concern? And this spoke to me. I feel this shows me a little bit more of the heart of Jesus Christ, that I have such a burden that when others are weak, I feel weak. When others are led into sin, I, he doesn't say without my intense judgment. He doesn't say without my intense accusation. He says without my intense concern. He's deeply concerned about the spiritual lives and state and growth and development of the brothers and sisters. He says, there's the daily pressure of me on me of concern for all the churches. And when it when it I feel as I was asking myself, what does it mean to minister to the Lord? I feel this is an area that in 2018 the Lord wants me to grow. That I have a daily pressure of concern. Forget all the churches. What about my church? What about NCCF? Can I say I have a daily pressure of concern in my heart that's manifested inwardly, privately? I don't mean to be um, speaking of external signs so that those might follow, but is there a daily concern on my heart? To me, that's what this ministry to the Lord is. It's a secret love for the church. And then fasting, the other thing that's mentioned there in um, Acts 13, verse 2, is says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, and to me, fasting spoke of a couple of things. One is mourning over sin, having a sense of mourning and a, a longing that the Lord would purify me as he is pure completely. But then not only that, also a sense of preparing my heart in anticipation. You know, Jesus said to his disciples that when they weren't able to cast out the demon, he said, this is only, this kind can only come out by prayer and fasting. 
Did he expect them to fast momentarily in the moment? No. He expected that they were living a life of preparation, that when they encountered a need because of their lifestyle of prayer and fasting, they would be prepared for what God had sent. And I see that fasting of preparation is something that is needed. Um, we heard, this is one of the messages that really spoke to my heart this last year. Sandeep mentioned from 2 Corinthians 5. I'm going to turn there. This really spoke to my heart, and it stayed with me. Find good evidence of a word being from the Lord for you as it stays with you. It won't let go. It keeps coming to your mind. This has kept coming to my mind. He says in 2 Corinthians 5, in verse 4, he says, Indeed, while we're in this tent, we're in this body, we groan because we're burdened, because we don't want to be unclothed, but to be clothed, so that what is mortal might be swallowed up by life. And I was thinking for myself, my problem is I'm so easily satisfied. I'm so prone to being satisfied. And I have good reason to be satisfied in a sense. The Lord's given me you all. The Lord's given me a wonderful family. The Lord's given me wonderful things. And it's so, things are so great right now that it's, the, I believe the danger for me, and maybe the danger for us is that we settle for less than God's very best. We stop groaning. We stop having this burden of longing for more. And, um, I remember earlier this year, maybe it was last year, when we were studying through Haggai, one of the verses that really spoke to my heart, and we can turn there, it's Haggai, I think it's chapter 2 or 3. Yeah, it's Haggai chapter 2. In verse 3, this, this word that says, Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? How do you see it now? Does it seem like nothing in comparison to you? And I feel one of the words that the Lord spoke clearly to my heart as I read that was, Do you have eyes of faith to see this temple or this church in its future glory? Is there anyone among you who sees what God wants this church to be in its future glory? And how does it seem to you now? All the good that you've received, all the wonderful exhortation and encouragement, all the what, all the things which you thought, you could, can't get any better than this. Does it not seem like nothing to you in comparison? And for me, I want these days, these days where we're so blessed, these days where we have so much to be grateful for, to seem to me as I look back 10 or one, even one year from now, I want these days to seem like nothing in comparison. And the only way that, that will happen is if I conduct myself, not only certainly have a sense of gratitude, but also if I conduct myself with a sense of holy discontentment, that I'm not satisfied. And that's what I see in Acts chapter 13. They were ministering to the Lord. They were doing, they were obedient in all they had been commanded. They were diligent to do all that God had said, and yet they weren't content. And for me, I feel it's, it's a real danger that we may be taken up with doing all that God has given us, but that we might grow just a little content or not have a sense of groaning, not have a sense of holy discontentment. And, you know, I, I was reminded of Jesus, the disciples of John in Matthew 9, they came to him and said, hey, maybe it was the Pharisees, they came to him and said, hey, your disciples don't fast. What's up with that? And Jesus said, yeah, it's because the bridegroom's with them. It's Matthew 9. He said, the bridegroom's with them. So of course they don't fast. Verse 15, Jesus said, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom's with them, can they? So he's saying, I'm here. As long as I'm here, my disciples won't fast. But then it says, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away. And what did Jesus say in John 14? When I'm taken away, then God will, my Father will send the helper. So as long as Jesus was here, fasting was inappropriate. But when the Holy Spirit had come, what Jesus says here is it's as appropriate to fast when the Holy Spirit's here as it was inappropriate to fast when Jesus was here. And he says, there's an interesting phrase in verse 19, uh, 17, sorry. He says, nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst. But the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins and both are preserved. So I see this, the principle or the practice of fasting, this practice of expectation, in some sense it preserves this gift of groaning. It says the Holy Spirit groans in our hearts too deep for words. And I see that. It says both are preserved. There's something about fasting and the propriety of fasting, that, that how it's appropriate to conduct myself with a sense of expectation and longing, that it preserves the expectation that the Holy Spirit has when he's given to me. 
And I want to preserve that groan of the Holy Spirit. And I see that attitude of fasting, certainly the act, but also the attitude of fasting as a reminder to groan with the Holy Spirit. So going back to Acts 13, uh, the verse I started with, Acts 13 two, I do feel that we're at a unique point in our church's journey and that God desires to do something special for us here. I don't entirely know what it is, but I want to be found just like the church in Antioch was found uh, ready and worthy to receive more because they, it says, while they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Lord was able to do more. I want to be found in the way, so to speak, ministering to the Lord and fasting. And for me, ministering to the Lord speaks of bearing you all in my heart and growing in my secret love, my secret concern, my secret burden for you all. And fasting speaks of preserving this attitude of groaning, this attitude of holy discontentment with all that I've experienced so far. So I'm eager to see what the Lord has for us in 2018.